So the big news yesterday in government. Let me start with this. The two gentlemen who woke up Monday and thought, uh-oh, am I ever on the hot seat? And when yesterday came and went, they slept like babies. Their names not really in the conversation any further, which is remarkable. Minister Nick McGraw, he committed what he admits freely were distinct problems and errors in his judgment and consequently resigns his ministerial portfolio in transportation and works. Albeit on the way out with, I did nothing wrong, but of course you did. You did something wrong, that's why you quit. So come on, st stop that. And then we have Keith Russell, who is now the Minister for Labrador and Aboriginal Affairs, even with the baggage that he knows full well he carries around. He knows he does. Dealing with Aboriginal affairs after consequently referring to spiritual connections as mumbo jumbo, some of his other issues in minor hockey rinks and with member as a member of the Inuit government. These men were worried. And they went home last night going, Phew, man, that wasn't too bad. Why? Because the focus is now on Premier Davis's cabinet. We'll talk about some of what should be, you know, also mentioned are some, I think, legitimate combinations of departments, some proactive moves that make a lot of sense to me. We'll talk about some of those. But the issue of the day surrounds the appointment of unelected Judy Manning to the role of the Attorney General and the Minister of Public Safety. Several things inside this. The public safety rebranding is interesting on many fronts. People very quickly latch on to the fact and they go, excuse me? There's no Department of Justice? When... I mean, that's the trick if you're trying to rebrand anything and try to bring a bunch of different facets of justice and public safety under the one umbrella. And it's a tricky one to navigate, and it obviously hasn't worked very well for a variety of reasons. So public safety, okay, fine. But the real story is Judy Manning. All right. So the questions I think are legitimate, and we'll pose some of them here. Now, Judy and Judy Manning and the Premier were here speaking with Fred Hunt this morning. People ask, who's Judy Manning? What's her qualifications? What makes her a good choice amongst all of the unelected attorneys in Newfoundland and Labrador? Right? What's her background? Who is she? What's her connection to the party? Whose hands have been greased? What payback is in play? All of those types of questions which are generally based in cynicism, but they are legitimate when we don't know the answer, so people would ask. Judy Manning is a Manning from up to shore. Jody Manning is a Manning from St. Brides. The Tory connections are clear. Her father, Eugene, not a politician. Her uncle, Fabian, very much so. Judy has connections long and deep to the PC party, and that's, listen, let's call spades spades. If you have distinct connections to the party, then you have a lot of opportunities for appointments and or to be the preferred candidate in races. And that's all of you out there, NDP, Liberal and PCs, everyone stop with the no preferred candidate stuff. So that's why she got the appointment. Is that good or bad? For many people who are tired of patronage, tired of the backroom deal, tired of the cronyism, that will be viewed as nothing but bad. That's how it works. People are tired of the that approach to politics. And understandably so. But what's also interesting on that front is that immediately means that some people will besmirch Judy Manning's reputation before they even know who she is. As long as she's a Manning Tory from up the shore, that's all they need to condemn Judy Manning, which is patently unfair. But that's the way the game goes, right? And I think she knows that going in. Then the biggest issue here. It is not unprecedented that someone who's not an elected member to be appointed to a ministerial role. It's not. It has happened, and many times here in this province and across the country. The problem is, for the Tories, is that the political convention is quite clear. You can do what Premier Davis did in selecting Judy Manning. You can discuss her background and whatever we see fit. But the issue is, that person should seek election in the first available opportunity. Three of those are right in front of us. Three of them include by-elections in now vacant seats where Tories have walked away. She's not going to do it. She's going to wait to run in Placentia St. Mary's in the general election, wherever that may be. Now, Premier Davis, whether or not he means that he's going to call it early, he's intimating that there is no... It's not set in stone that they'll go out a year from now, so we'll see on that front. But we're not going to let that take our eye off the prize. Miss Manning's in a difficult spot here. She is committed 
to not running in any of the three by-elections. That's a huge problem. This is a problem for the Tories on some of the obvious levels. When you're a government that is facing a downward trend in the polls, when you're a government that is trying to combat characterizations and terms that people hang and to represent the government, secretive, not transparent, not accountable, and one of the tricky ones is arrogant. That's a word that people use many times to refer to the PCs over the last decade or so and the current edition of the PC government. Is arrogance. So when Davis, whether or not you think his selection is wise, prudent, pragmatic, or good or bad in Miss Manning, the fact that she's not going to take on one of those three by-elections that are upcoming, it should be held sooner than later, people will indeed hang the word arrogance on the government and Miss Manning and the Premier for going down this road. People are also asking, what about John Ottenheimer? I mean, John Ottenheimer, boy, he's a Tory. He was, you know, after the first ballot convention, he was the man who led in the vote count of delegates to be the premier. What about him? Now, I spoke to Ottenheimer a couple of times over the last little while. Apparently, there was conversations with the government, Premier Davis and Ottenheimer. I can't imagine for one second Ottenheimer was going to come in and take a role like this and face the fire. He was looking for the top job. He didn't get it. I can't imagine Ottenheimer was interested in one iota. What was the formal question posed? I don't know. Neither did any of you. What about Felix Collins? He was the Attorney General. He is the current member in Placentia St. Mary's. Why doesn't he stay on in that role until there's a general election? Then Miss Manning could run and then consequently be appointed to the AG role and to whatever ministerial file they see fit. This is where the problem lies, you know, for the Tories. If, if and when Collins was going to retire before the next general election, then it's almost too late if he does it now, even though it's the only way out for the Tories. You know? If he was going to retire in a month or two, he should have done it on Friday. So that this appointment would be criticized based on who is Miss Manning, what's her allegiance to the party, how did she get this job, who knows who, who knows what, and how deep does the relationship run? All those questions are part and parcel of politics. But this is a tricky one, man. This is a tricky one for them. This one doesn't cycle out of the news either, right? You know, so the Keith Russell issue, we haven't even talked about it. Why? Because it's been overshadowed by Nick McGraw. We haven't talked about that much. Why? Because it's been overshadowed by Junie Manning. You know, the old change of the channel, the change in the narrative, the what used to be pretty savvy politics, Butch and Rao, we're all onto it. We understand how they operate their message. We understand how they attempt to deflect. We understand how they attempt to, 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 to diffuse. This one's not going to work, though, because Miss Manning will always be in the conversation. When the House reopens, the first question from the Liberals will be inevitably directed at the Minister of Public Safety, who is not in the House to answer the question. This one does not go away and it will not cycle out of the news because it represents a lot of the things that people don't like about politics. It's really, really a tricky one. Anyway, you want to talk about it, and I know you do, and I think it's... It's certainly worthy of conversation because it's, you know, it is what it is. All right, what else have we got here? So the concept of Nick McGraw and what, I mean, if you're prioritizing the stories for me, just in this cabinet shelf of peace, the biggest story, and I don't know why it isn't, is Nick McGraw. It is the biggest story with the most severe implications. People are clamoring for judicial inquiry, even though that might not be the appropriate role, if you are looking for heads to roll and to roll away in bracelets, which might be an exaggeration. But if that's what you're wanting, then a police investigation is what you actually want, not a judicial inquiry with no real real meat available, no firm resolution like you're all hoping for. So that would be the story. Then it would be Russell, then it would be Manning. But we're not. It's Manning. So anyway, the conversation then takes a turn to women in politics. Justifiably, understandably, we do have a distinct shortage of women involved in politics at every level, municipally, provincially, and federally. No question in anybody's mind. And there are hurdles that need to be cleared so that more women would potentially be interested in seeking elected office. So it's the woman issue. All right. Now, whatever role that wants to play in the Judy Manning story, I'll leave that up to you. And this will draw the ire of some of my friends, and in particular some of my women friends who I talk politics with, and we've been long time and very close friends, and we have distinct difference of opinion on some of these issues. And so I read an article last night, and this is about women in politics. And it's not only about women as playing active roles, and one 
author. She shoots down the quota of parliamentarians, municipal councillors, provincial MHAs, MLAs. She shoots it down because it's virtually unmanageable and cannot be enforced. Same thing with members of a board. You know, feminism's not a bad word. It is not the F word. But some people who are so extreme on either side of it have really sidetracked and betrayed the conversation, in my personal opinion. Feel free to fight back. There's a phone line open for you this morning. But then they just they take the issues on to classifying certain things as women's issues, and I personally take exception to it. Now, I'm not a woman. I haven't lived as a woman. I don't know exactly how women feel about anything. Why? Because I'm a man, and we don't understand, right? But here, I'm going to say some of these things out loud, and you feel free to pick up on them. They classify certain issues as women's issues, like child care. Look... If it affects a disproportionate number of women compared to men, the child care issue, that all of a sudden makes it a women's issue as opposed to a family issue. And doesn't it take, like if you have the stand, whatever a household would be represented as, a man or a wife, two moms, two dads, you know, a child, pick a fence, hopefully on your own home, da 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 Why is that all of a sudden simply a women's issue? And that one I can kind of get and kind of wrap my mind around. But then they take it on to early childhood learning is a women's issue. I mean, come on. At some point, someone has to stand up. I'll take my knocks for this one because I am now going to be quite clear. Early childhood learning is not a women's issue. It's a family issue. And in particular, it's a young child issue. That child may indeed be a male. So some of these things that we sidetrack, you know, we only talk about women, how they look and how they present themselves and their hair, and it's so unfair. Except that's not true. We don't just do that to women. We do it to human beings, including men. How many times have I had to hear about John Baird's scowl, Stephen Harper's shark eyes, Justin Trudeau's wavy hair? We do it to everyone. It's what we're like. Human nature plays a role here. We almost inevitably judge books by their cover. It's unfair. It's unwarranted. It's senseless. It makes no friggin' sense whatsoever. But we all do it. But we do it to men and women. Anyway, that stuff just gets me going. You want to talk about it? Fine. Great. Good. Good enough for me. Inside the cabinet portfolio stuff, some actual decent moves. Now, okay, public safety. All right. So a retired constable is the premier. The former chief of police is his chief of staff. And immediately the conversation, some of this is the most bogus, gutter, scrape in politics available. We will now refer to things at the Confederation Building as a police state. If you are going to be a politician and use that as one of your phrases to attack the Tories, this police state, diminishing of rights, and no more Justice Department, and oh my God, the police state, and the Gestapo, and the, and the goose step, and the jackboot, you might as well just throw Hitler in there by be done with it so we can classify he's a crackpot. You know, do we have to worry because there's cops at the helm? There may be some issues that we should concern ourselves with, questions we should ask. But the immediate knee-jerk reaction of this is a new police state, do you really believe the things you say? I mean, seriously. Just because the term justice is not in the department doesn't mean they've turned their back on justice. Doesn't mean that police, with all the senior bureaucrats and the smart people, of which there are some at the Federation building, can include uh, an attention to public safety, all the while protecting the rights of the people, which is the overriding mandate of justice. 